Hi, everyone. Uh, yeah, so I'm here to talk about the future of data in MOJ, which, uh, as was said before, sounds like quite a big topic, so hopefully I can do it some kind of justice. Uh, but <laughs> <that's good. laughs> this is what it's about. Uh, I think everyone here has seen this word before. Uh, and we've seen three great talks on it, right? So we've seen Ollie tell us about how we can use data to support financially vulnerable people. Uh, Emma's given me a great tee up by talking about a data linking project right where I work. Uh, Graham's just told us about using uh, data to counteract fraud. Um, and uh, so I guess it's the theme, and people who've been here before must have seen lots of talks on this stuff. Like most organizations, the MOJ wants to use its data better. Um, so what, what does that mean? Well, the goal is to get all that stuff we do as a Ministry of Justice from courts and prisons and so on. Uh, every time someone interacts with us, we collect that data for operational needs often. Let's collect that stuff uh, and let's do some insight from that data, get some insight using analytics, using data science, and let's get that insight in front of people uh, who can use it to make decisions. Now, that could be operational people or it could be senior decision makers, or it could be policy makers, or you know, the sky's the limit with this sort of stuff. Um, but the crucial thing is all of that data has to come from somewhere, and it comes originally from the front line, from the operational people. Um, so uh, my team, I work for the data engineering team, uh, we did a bit of work mapping out how that data kind of flows through our systems at the moment. Uh, and we got something that looks a bit like this, so I guess the detail isn't that important here, obviously. And I've redacted the names of the data sets and so on anyway, but you know, you've got a whole bunch of uh, sort of frontline services over here, and then it passes through some kind of collecting thing, it goes to some other teams, they do some other stuff, they send it to some other teams, and it ends up over here, some kind of decision-making people. It looks kind of complicated, is the point, right? But actually, it's more complicated than this, because actually, if you take just one little sort of bit of this or something, like here, this is one data set, and how it gets through to the final decision-maker, if you actually zoom in on that, you find that each one of these links is itself a complicated network. And probably if you zoomed on that work network, you'd get the same thing. There's a kind of scale-free complexity to this. Uh, and if you do all that substitution, substitute all the links in, you get this bigger network and bigger network, and once you start factoring in where people are saving this stuff and how they're spreading it around and so on, you get this huge network that basically ends up looking something like this. <laughs> this is data journeys, right? So why is this a bad thing? Well, uh, I'm gonna focus on four reasons why it's a bad thing for the moment. Uh, so these are four uh, things that we have with our data, and I should stress this is not all the data sets, but the, these things are present to some degree in a lot of our data sets. So timeliness is the first one. Uh, it takes a lot of time and effort for data to traverse this complicated web, um, and often it can only be obtained in the first place over here from some uh, data set that's outsourced that we only have some limited access to that we have to get only you know, a certain snapshot every few months or something. The point being, by the time it gets over here to the decision makers, often the data will be out of date or, or you know, not really uh, sufficient for the purposes of, that they need. This is especially true for operational data. If you're trying to make a decision on the ground, you, there's no good having data from four months ago often. So second thing, auditability. Uh, if your data is coming through this kind of complicated web, and a lot of this, at least you know, when teams pass each, each other, they're doing manual processing, uh, they're emailing it to each other. We often can't say exactly when the data was extracted or what's happened to it en route. Um, so, you know, it's hard for us to audit that data or, or to feed back to find any, any errors in it. Uh, so, consistency here. Uh, again, if it, as one data source starts, there's one over here. By the time it goes through this, per percolates through this system, you've got several different data sets. It's saved in different places, often in local drives and so on. So, you've got multiple copies. Trying to keep those consistent is basically impossible. And obviously, as an extra thing, having multiple copies of the data, even if they're all saved on our secure corporate network, it's not ideal for security to have lots of copies. And then we have reproducibility. So I guess all of these things come together to say we can't be confident of obtaining the exact data used to inform a previous decision, whether that's an operational decision or a policy one. If we want to say, well, how did we come to that decision? We have to hope that Bob's still got the data on his hard drive somewhere, otherwise. So again, it's not all the data sets, but these are problems we frequently come up with, and the solution to these problems is these guys, uh, the data engineers, uh, and this is my team, so I guess I would say that. But uh, the question is, what do data engineers do? Well, what we do is we take this complica that complicated web and we replace it with, ideally, one single data pipeline. Again, what does that mean? Well, it says here we're using modern tools and technologies. What that basically means, we get the data from as close to its raw form as possible, ideally in some kind of automated feed, uh, we timestamp it so we know when we got it. As soon as we get it in our area, we back it up so we've got an archive of the raw data. Uh, and then we basically, all the processing, all the cleaning, all the manipulation of that data then happens in code 
on a, uh, in our cloud platform environment so that we can say, well, we know this was the raw data from this particular snapshot, and we've you know, used this version of code on it, so we know exactly what's happened to it. Uh, and we can, get, we can then serve that. We move it onto like a service area, curated data area, and our analysts and data scientists can get it from there. So they pull it directly from there, either working in that same cloud environment or, or locally, um, depending on their requirements. So why is that good? Well, we can come back to our four things. Timeliness, suddenly now, because the data is processed automatically, it takes you know, a tiny amount, uh, hardly any time at all. Seconds, in some cases, depending on the size of the data set. Um, and it can be up to date as decision makers need, assuming we can get that original feed. So we have things that go you know, daily, we can have jobs that run hourly that keep getting the latest version of this, this data. Um, we use uh, schedulers, obviously, so we can run this stuff overnight if we need to. We don't need to have a person there clicking go and waiting, you know, go and make a cup of tea while their computer locks up. Um, because our stack is uh, performant, we can do all that. And obviously, we can also do it all within our cloud platform environment. We can do it all in a secure way, which is great. So auditability, I said that our pipelines are made in code. They're version controlled using GitHub. So we know exactly what version of the code we've used. So it's, it's completely auditable. Uh, we can go back to GitHub and say, oh, look, this was a mistake here. And then we can correct that mistake and release a new version. Uh, consistency, uh, if the analysts and data scientists are getting the data from our curated area, we know, you know, everyone knows which version of the data they've got. It's stamped into the data itself, what the provenance of that data is. So, you know, we know we've got consistency. Um, but also, crucially, as I said, we back everything up, all the raw data. So we've actually got time-stamped historical versions of this as well. So if you want to find the data from four months ago or something, you can pull that, no problem at all. And you can run like the latest version of the cleaning thing on that rather than the old one if you want to. Uh, so if we have, that comes to our reproducibility point, if we find some sort of error in our processing, not only can we rerun it on future versions of the data, but we can kind of backdate it onto the past versions as well and make sure that everything, the whole archive is correct, which is magic. Uh, so data engineers of the future, uh, data is not going away, as we've seen from, you know, this is the fifth data bytes and we're hoping for more. Uh, it's only getting more important. I think citizens will expect us to be able to use all this, uh, to improve our services by using operational data and to do any of this accurately, sensitively, securely or reproducibility, we're gonna, or reproducibly we're going to need data engineers. So if you want to use machine learning in a complicated operational environment like a prison, you need good quality data. If you want to do rapid policy development with, you know, experimentation and evaluation, you need good data. If you want to link your data sets, as uh, Emma's kindly teed up, you can need good data to do it. So basically, as analysis moves into those cloud-based environments, data engineering skills are going to become more and more important. And you know, I can proudly say that I think in the Ministry of Justice, we're really um, doing some of the best work I've seen across government in this way, partly because I think our, our cloud platform is so good. Um, and we're using kind of technology that I think is as good as anything in the private sector. Um, so I'd say, finish by just saying, data engineering, I think, has the potential to revolutionize the way we use data in the Ministry of Justice and hopefully set the direction for, for government more generally. Um, so my last slide is just to say that when I've said that we're doing all this, obviously I don't do any of this. These people are the actual data engineers. Uh, and if anyone's got any questions, I'm happy to take them. Thanks. Perfect. <laughs> questions? Uh, we've got one there, one there, and one there. Perfect. Uh, Jenny O'Connor, GDS. Um, in the forthcoming national data strategy, with your data engineer hat on, what kind of, what were your kind of uh, topics to go in there for you? Thank you. We've got Sam over there. Sorry. Me again. Um, I presume that officially this government believes in the rule of law. Um, <laughs> why are you laughing? <laughs> Who has responsibility for court data? Is it the judiciary, HMCTS, MOJ, etc.? And who is responsible for reviewing the arrangements for publishing judge, good judgments? Because I know it's in your team. And given, and to go back to the question I had earlier, which wasn't a, the answer to a completely different question, given there are ADR people in the room and it was an MOJ project, are your ministers, the judges, and project reviewers confident that MOJ? with no anonymization experience, was accurate in your application and didn't screw it up, and my FOI has two weeks before you have to reply to it. Thank you. Uh, hi, Paul Maltby from the Ministry of Houses. So um, to what extent is that data engineering effort only possible after you fix some of the legacy issues for the core services, or is it possible to do it in a parallel way? Thank you.
Uh, thanks. So some tough questions there. <laughs> uh, uh, so Jenny, uh, the National Data Strategy, I mean, it's not something I've actually thought about or prepared. So uh, speaking off the cuff, I think topics for data generally, I mean, I think we need to think about, I guess it comes into what we've said about some data linking stuff quite often. The data that we collect is collected and used uh, in the public sector for operational purposes, and that's well and good. But I think, and in fact I've been saying in separate talks this week to people at MOJ, that we need to start thinking of the services that we provide also seeing the data that they're collecting as part of that service. And that service should be probably internal, but could also provide open data in some, some circumstances. So I think that seeing that data as part of services that are provided, particularly, in, I guess, in digital areas, because it's slightly easier to collect the data. But that would be something I'd really want to see pushed in, in any national strategy. Uh, Sam, was it? Yeah, I don't know specifically about the ADR uh, application and whether we screwed it up. <laughs> Fortunately, I wasn't involved directly in writing it. Um, so yeah, I take your point though, I guess your broader point about who takes responsibility for court data and how we're linking this stuff up. Um, I think it is a difficult area. I think we do have to be careful. Um, again, that's partly about having good oversight in place. Um, so we spend a lot of time and effort in my team trying to do as much of this possible, as much of this infrastructural stuff in terms of, I mean, to me, things like anonymization, um, retention, redaction, deletions, a lot of these things to me are um, technical challenges to make sure that we have the infrastructure in place that deals with this stuff, that we can define, like in a config, this is the rules for this data set and just have the machine do it for us because if you have people doing it, there's going to be mistakes. So I think that's the way I see the challenge as much as possible and, you know, I'm not going to tell you we've solved that, we're learning still, we're working out the best way of, of doing that stuff. Um, yeah, so I can't really speak to the legal side of it, but it's definitely a challenge that we're serious about. Um, and then uh, Paul said about the legacy issues. Uh, so a lot of these data sets that I've been talking about that we started working on are the kind of big legacy data sets. But uh, in the Ministry of Justice, we're looking to change the way that we serve a lot of this stuff. So we're moving from these big ossified monoliths to kind of microservices approach. And absolutely, that's going to be a big help, I think, to the data engineering challenge because well, it's kind of a help and a hindrance, right? On the one hand, the big services, it's a lot of data. They're hard to get to. You have issues of scale and so on. Um, but once you crack that, once you've got into it, you kind of got a solid pipeline and you know what's coming. Um, but the advantage of the microservices is they're a bit more flexible, um, which means that I think once you can get the access there, you can start, uh, I guess you can start saying, the analysts hopefully will have more input there to say what data they want collected and what will be useful and what insights can be got if we can just get that extra bit of data. So I think it's going to be really beneficial. Um, it should be more accessible, I guess, to my team anyway. Fantastic. Um, next set of questions. Got one there. Any more? And one at the back from Matt again. Hi, I'm Bethan from GDS. Um, so we've done a lot of work over the last year on the kind of innovation strategy and the government AI review as part of that. One of the big things that we found through this research was, you know, we often talk about how government needs more data scientists, but actually data engineers don't really get a lot of airtime, and actually they, having data engineering skills in government is one of the key enablers to doing kind of machine learning, AI, predictive analytics. And so from your perspective, I'd be really interested to know what we could do to kind of improve the amount of data engineering talent that we bring into government. Mm -hmm. Again, from the Cabinet Office. Um, I've heard lots about the analytical platform over, over the last couple of years. Uh, it's really, as I think it's a really interesting development. As you say, I think it's sort of probably at the cutting edge of like how analytical t developments in, in, in data management is going in government. Um, and not to say I would like, well, I would love analytical platform in a box that I could just pick up and, and deploy. Um, but I guess there's, the big question for me was what's the, how did you make the business case for, because there's, there's, got, there's a cost in this, setting this sort of stuff up. How did you make the business case for that at a time when we haven't always got the, the money for analysis and, and it's always that sort of like, oh, no, we don't need to put that in there. We, put, we should uh, devote the money over to the operational stuff. Thank you. Uh, great, thanks. Uh, so to Bethan, how to get more data engineers. Yep, I totally agree with you. Uh, there has been a lot of focus on data scientists in government and not much on data engineers. And certainly the journey that we and MOJ have been on has very much been that way around. We've had a lot of data scientists and so on, and we've done some really great work on that, and uh, data scientists are really valuable, speaking as someone who was in that team. <laughs> um, 
But what happens is, if you don't have the data engineering done, is you find you end up doing a lot of prototypes. You end up doing a lot of stuff on static data. You can show what could be possible, but when you want to start productionalizing that, you know, you hit into a barrier really quickly. Um, and that's the business we're in. You know, we're not in a business. We're not, if you're, uh, I guess, working in other environments, it might be okay to make some sort of prototype and then expect someone else to productionize it. But we are, in the end, providing services for people, and we need to be able to productionize them. So yeah, we need more data engineers desperately. Um, how to get them? Well, I guess that's one of the reasons why I'm here talking, right? To try and uh, encourage interest in data engineering as a field and make people realize that it is actually pretty cool stuff. Um, I mean, I think the, the name, you know, the, the, the idea people have of data engineering is not really an accurate one of what, what they think, you know, you'll just be working on some Oracle database somewhere or something, something horrible, um, which is not the case. Uh, how to get more? I think we need to be more flexible in how we recruit people. I think the the recruitment process has changed, and I think that should hopefully make it a bit easier. But otherwise, it's a lot of outreach stuff. It's a lot of telling people, hey, there's really cool stuff going on in government, and we are actually doing stuff that's like solving challenges people don't know how to solve yet. And that hopefully should inspire people. I don't know. Um, and to Matt, yeah, so the analytical platform, I mean, it's, it's great. I guess I would say that. Uh, how we made the business case, I wasn't sadly involved right at the start, um, but I've seen some of the documents. I think like, the best case for something like the analytical platform is one of opportunity cost. Obviously, you can not spend money on a cloud platform, and you can carry on working in ways where you use your local machine and your secure image environment, and, but then analysts, are, a lot of them are using Excel uh, to do things, and again, that's fine. There's a lot of really great work done, but a lot of it, especially, you know, it's 2019 now, a lot of this work starts to look like it's being done in spite of the tech and not being helped by the tech. And once you have examples of what cool things can be done elsewhere with this tech, it, becomes, it makes it easier to make that case. So I've been helping other departments you know, how can they spread this word? And a lot of it, I think, is just examples. We happen to be luckily that we have the analytical platform, or I guess not lucky. People have done great work to get it going. Um, and I think, you know, the more we talk about this stuff, the more examples people can see. And it's a crucial thing is to have senior decision makers, right? Once they can see, hey, actually, if we can do this, we can start automating this statistical work or something, we can save FTE to do more interesting insights, and we can make a real difference in how the business is run, rather than at the moment having to hire lots of analysts to you know, count things, basically, and, and publish that every three months. Fantastic. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you.